hi, uh, everybody. Uh, so I'm here with Judge Mitch Crane, who, who you know, teaches here at, at Delaware State University in our MPA program. Um, and has quite a lot of, of relevant experience and background to share, um, and is going to walk us through a, a few of the nuances of the the, the recent Supreme Court case uh, overturning Roe v. Wade. So, uh, Judge Crane, can you tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and your background? Um, you know, your time on the bench to start with. I spent six years on the bench as a trial judge in Chester County, Pennsylvania. I've been practicing law for 48 years. I'm for three or four when I started. Uh, <laughs> I practiced most every area of the law. As I mentioned to you earlier, the only A I got in law school was in constitutional law. I've had a great interest in the constitutional law and the Supreme Court because my, I come from a family that has fought for rights of all sorts of people for three generations and it's inbred in me. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? My my grandparents were uh, organizers in the civil rights movement in the 20s and 30s. They were close to Paul Robeson, who was a major African-American actor and singer in the 50s, got blacklisted. My grandmother took me to his house when I was seven or eight in West Philly. Didn't know who he was. I went home and told my mother and she pulled out this record album and played it. Um, a few years later, I was 13 and I came home from school and there was this very pleasant African-American man with this beautiful African-American woman turned out to be his wife. And I didn't know until they introduced me that it was Martin Luther King and his wife, Coretta Scott King. My mother was friends with uh, Coretta's sister, Edith Scott Bagley, who taught at Cheney University in Pennsylvania. Um, 1963, after getting arrested with my grandmother at a civil rights demonstration in Brooklyn, and I told my mother about it. She said, wasn't it time, you know, that you do more than just go to protests? <laughs> and there was a march in Washington being planned for that August, August 23rd. She put me in, in, in touch with a friend of hers around the community center. His best friend growing up was the organizer of the march, Bayard Rustin, who was born and raised in Westchester. And my communication with Rustin helped me as a 16-year-old organizer the 14 buses from West Sisters that March. And Byard became a mentor of mine until he died in the early 80s. As a president of the West Chester City Council, I got a park named after him. And a few years later, a high school, Byard Rustin High School. That was a fight in itself. Uh, and when a book came out two years ago about the March in Washington, apparently Byard kept my letters from 63 and they were in it. That was kind of nice. So uh, I, former president of Stonewall, Delaware Stonewall PAC, which is, that, which is an LGBTQ organization. So in Delaware, I've been heavily involved in non-discrimination laws for LGBT people, then civil unions, and in marriage equality. And you've got some experience with uh, Planned Parenthood as well? My mother, thank you for reminding me, my mother was a founder of Planned Parenthood of Chester County, Pennsylvania. Um, and I've been involved with them even here. So this stuff matters to you? You could pick a lot of reasons to hate me if you're on the other side. That's <laughs> fine. Yes, they all matter to me. Okay, so um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what happened uh, Friday and the ruling that was made um, and on what case? Everybody was shocked about the case, even though it was leaked a couple months before and was something that pro-life Republicans have been promising and fighting to do for over 40 years. And Democratic voters and people for pro-choice thought it would never happen, and it happened. The Supreme Court, in a six to three vote, including the four people that were appointed by presidents who did not get a majority of the vote, ruled that there is no right to privacy. And the Roe versus Wade decision from 48 years ago was based on the right to privacy not on other issues such as due process or equal protection. What the Supreme Court decided last Friday was there is no right to privacy in the Constitution. And because there is no right to privacy, the decision that was made 48 years ago by a majority Republican bench should not be upheld and should be overturned. The result of that relative to the right to abortion is obvious, 
But if you eliminate the right to privacy, then what happens, and Justice Thomas brought that out in his concurring decision, is other decisions based on the right to privacy also would fail if challenged. And that means Griswold versus Connecticut, which was the first decision. In Griswold, Connecticut had a law that said that you could not use contraceptions. And there was rumor that a married couple was using contraceptions in their own home. And they got a search warrant, broke in and arrested them. When that case went to the Supreme Court, they decided that a husband and wife have a right to expect privacy in their own home. And that created a right to privacy, which did not appear anywhere in the constitution or in any of the amendments, even though two of the concurring justices said that the right should be assumed as enumerated rights that are in the Ninth Amendment. Following that, you had Roe, and then you had the Lawrence versus Texas decision, which said that consenting adults have a right to sexual relations in the, in the privacy of their own home, even if they're same sex. And that decision was used in the Obergefell decision, which established the right of same gender people to marry. If Thomas has, is right, then there are gonna be states that will pass laws eliminating all of those rights. They will eventually go up to the Supreme Court where a majority could overturn all of those decisions. The decision Friday was the first time in American history where the US Supreme Court has removed a right for the people that had been granted previously. What was the basis of the challenge that the court heard? Um, was it a privacy argument? No. A privacy argument would, it would have been upheld. What happened was that Texas and then Mississippi and other states passed a law restricting the right, a woman's right to abortion. Texas, I believe, was 12 weeks and Mississippi's others. Since then, some states have passed laws banning it altogether. And instead of listening to the Chief Justice Roberts and deciding only on Texas and saying, yes, 12 weeks is okay, they decided, let's get rid of the whole damn thing. And, and that is what they did. Uh, I do wanna point out that if they had listened to Justice Goldberg and, and uh, the other justice back when Roe was decided and had decided on, on equal protection, there was a foundation for that that goes back to Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy versus Ferguson was the 1898 decision by the Supreme Court 72, which said that separate but equal accommodations were okay. Matter of fact, Senator Cornyn on Friday said to, that Democrats should be concerned about precedents being overturned, should we go back to Plessy? But there's a difference. Plessy versus Ferguson was decided on due process and equal protection, and the court ruled there's nothing in the 15th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause, that says we must integrate functions. Separate functions are okay as long as they're equal. And then when Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka came up in 54, the argument wasn't to overrule Plessy, but to interpret the new facts, and the new facts were Separate is not working because separate is not equal, has not equal, and cannot be equal. That's what made that a super precedent. And the Roe versus Wade decision became a super precedent when Casey was decided. And they said, well, things have changed since Roe was granted. Now we know more about the viability of the fetus. So it's okay if, if, if states say you cannot abort a fetus after it's viable. But now they, they just said the hell with, excuse my language, a super precedent. It is a super precedent. Now three current members of the Supreme Court swore under oath that they would recognize and respect the super precedent. So the, the legal reasoning that the court used to make this decision had nothing to do with the arguments presented by uh, Mississippi or Texas. If they had used the legal reasoning, then they would have gone along with Roberts and the court would have had the power to uphold the Texas law or not. So they, they chose. It. They, they went passed it. Okay. And properly decided in the first place, let's just throw it out. That's what they said. 
um, does does their legal reasoning hold up in any way? Does their legal reasoning holds up if you no longer respect or honor super precedence. Okay. And this is the first time that what has been established as a super precedent has been thrown out. Now, super precedent, again, is an original case, and that case revisited, reinterpreted numerous times, and Roe has been. They have a right to do what they want. Someone asked me yesterday, who do you appeal this decision to? And I said, God's not going to intervene. Only the voters. Um, so, so that actually leads me to a really good question. What, what recourse do we have as people who are concerned for uh, the, the groups you know, and, and the issues that you're mentioning here? I respect those people who choose to protest. Protest is an American tradition goes back to the First Amendment right to speak and to assemble. However, nothing can be accomplished by marching and protesting and demonstrating because the only authority to change what happened is the Supreme Court. They can't do so without a case in front of them. So how do you change it? You can do what the other side did, which is spend 40 years trying to elect people who will appoint the right people to the court or we can start now. And we start now. We have an election this November. It's an off-year election. Two people vote in an off-year election. An off-year election is a turnout election. Who turns out more of the voters aligned with them? Is That's who wins. You have races that are borderline races for the US Congress, the House of Representatives, which will determine whether or not Pro-choice people have a majority? Would you pro life people take over? And if that happens, there'll be no legislation. The Senate is divided 50-50 with the vice president breaking that tie. There are people who wanted to break the filibuster, but two Democrats refused to do so. The control of the Senate is on the ballot in November also. There are a number of Democratic incumbents who are pro-choice who have tough races. And there are three or four states where there are challenging, challenging Democrats to pro-life Republicans who believe abortion should be allowed under no circumstances, and those people can win. So you campaign for them, you vote for them if you live in those states, you send them money if you have that ability. That's what has to be done. Even in Delaware, pro-choice candidates, chose choice elected officials, have a supermajority in both the House and the Senate by one. If they lose that supermajority, they lose the ability to codify Roe versus Wade into Delaware law, which they just did, to codify equal protection and the right to privacy, which they're now talking about doing. So we can't grow here either. Protesting is what you do when nothing else can be done. The purpose of protesting is to bring attention and publicity, the March on Washington. But once it's done and the vote doesn't matter, protesting has to stop and activism is necessary. And that's the ballot box. And so if we don't act, what are the potential consequences? The decision on Friday will become the law. 26 states have already banned abortion at one level or another, many altogether. Other states have trigger laws in effect. Trigger laws were laws that were to take effect when and if the Supreme Court overturned Roe. Others are introducing legislation to ban all abortion, not just medical procedures, but chemical procedures. Some states have laws and others introducing laws that make it illegal, criminal for a doctor to perform an abortion, make it criminal for a woman to leave Texas and come to Delaware to have a procedure. So th those are terrible things. So. We have to be prepared for those things to happen and for people to go to court, like in Delaware, and then take that up to the Supreme Court and hope that by the time it gets there, things have changed, which means a majority in the Senate for Joe Biden or whoever successor is to appoint good judges who will take an oath and will live up to that oath and will eventually overturn that decision. But there has to be a case created to do so. 
Thank you. And I'm going to ask you one last question. And you, you've already kind of touched on this a little bit. Yes. But uh, say you're a, uh, you're a college student. What can you do today to make some kind of impact? Contribute money to Planned Parenthood. There's a lot of talk. I saw it on Facebook. And I've seen some people nationally say, well, we should, we should raise money and, and so that people can come here to have procedures. Well, that's fine. But you need money to get people to fly up from Mississippi to get a procedure in the north or the west. Uh, they need, don't have IDs. They don't have driver's license. They have to learn, get that to fly. Some of these people, unfortunately, have jobs they would lose or children at home. So the money has to be sufficient to take care of all those needs, including daycare and, and, and job protections. There are major corporations that are taking those steps. Those things can be done. And what else you can do? Contact your local elected officials and make sure they're on your side. And then find candidates for office elsewhere. If you have five hours to give them, five hours helps. Every, I won my election to the bench in Pennsylvania by two votes. Every little bit helps. All right. Thank you so much, Judge Crane. I do really appreciate you talking to all of us today. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.